Good evening, and thank you all for joining us here again tonight. Um, we're going to keep the same format that we've had for all of these. We're going to listen to our speakers and then take the media questions, one person, one question at a time. And first we have Dep uh, Director of Public Health, Catherine Wells. Good evening, everyone. Um, we've provided everybody in attendance with a copy of the updated case count. Um, as you can see, the number of cases today um, did not, we didn't see an increase in the number of cases here in Lubbock. We did see some reporting of cases in some of our surrounding counties. I don't want people to read into this, um, you know, and look and say, oh, we have, this is all over. We don't have to worry anymore. Um, we were not expecting to receive cases today um, due to laboratory testing and when, um, specimens get shipped to the laboratory and shipped to Austin or shipped to our LRN. Um, we didn't expect to get any case, uh, any results back today, and we expect to receive a large number of results back tomorrow morning and then probably another batch in the afternoon. Um, UMC today screened over 300 individuals at the drive-up clinic, and that doesn't count the number of individuals that were screened um, by consultation at their provider's office, at phone calls that were received at the health department, or at our call center. Um, so there's still a lot of call volume. Um, people are still being screened, and we did send individuals for testing today, and I expect some of those to come back positive tomorrow. Um, I also kind of wanted to go over some um, safety and readiness tips um, to go into as now that we're looking at seeing more uh, COVID-19 in our community. Yesterday we talked about um, seeing some community spread. So these are recommendations that we really want to see um, from everybody out there. And when we talk about social distancing, we're really talking about um, distancing um, both indoors and outdoors. Um, so when you go out to the grocery store, you know, make sure you keep that six feet um, from other customers, take some space when you're um, standing in line, definitely keep that distance. Um, also keep that distance out when you're out walking. My friend and I did a social distancing walk around Tech Terrace Park on Sunday afternoon. We both stayed six feet apart. We both couldn't fit on the trail next to each other, um, but it was a great way to catch up with a good friend and also um, practice that social distancing. Um, also, when you're out and about and you're touching those high touch areas, those gas pumps, the credit card ATM screen, um, you know, we want um, the owners of those um, to um, wash those frequently, but then we also want to remind people if you've been outdoors, um, out in public, as soon as you walk in that house, wash those hands real well with soap and water to make sure we get rid of any of those germs. Um, we also want to make sure we're cleaning things like those cell phones, um, anything that we're constantly using in our household, table, um, washing down countertops and um, faucets and stuff in our bathrooms. Um, we also want to still remind people to stay at home and really restrict those ex excursions outside of our house to those things that we really need. We're not saying you can't go to the grocery store. We're not saying you can't go get medical care. But if you don't need to go out into public, into those public areas, don't leave your house you know, enjoy your neighborhood, enjoy your parks, um, but don't go out in public unnecessarily. And then we're also recommending that employers start look at, looking at employee screening. Uh, we instituted employee screening this morning at the health department. Um, so everybody walking in the door um, gets screened for a fever and then we do the same thing in the afternoon. And that's really to check to make sure the health of our staff um, if anybody is sick, we can make sure that we isolate them at home and then we keep that full functioning health department going um, through this outbreak. Thank you. And I'll pass it on to Dr. Cook. Thank you again, Catherine. So I only want to go over a couple of things with you this afternoon. One of those is, again, reiterate, if you're ill, you need to stay home. Again, if you're ill, stay home. You don't need to be going anyplace. You need to put yourself on isolation, remove yourself from other people, and stay home. So the CDC also has excellent guidelines on how to take care of somebody that may be ill in your house. And I'd like to go over those things with you. So if at all possible, separate yourself from that individual. If that individual can sleep in their own bedroom, that's fantastic. Maybe you need to move on the couch as the caregiver, and they stay in the bedroom. If you don't. If you have the opportunity not to share a bathroom, say you have two bathrooms in your house, 
separate those bathrooms, stay in your own bathroom, or that, let that ill person have their own bathroom. Frequently wash down any soiled items. You know, access to gloves, even dish gloves that we used to use, see around all the time, those dish gloves can be used over. Disinfect those with some weak bleach solution. That's easy to do. The other thing to do is if you handle any soiled material that they may have, towels, Kleenexes, taking out their trash in their bathroom or their bedroom, make sure you wear those dish gloves would work just fine. The other thing that we need to do is make sure you wash your hands frequently with soap and water. This is singing yourself happy birthday. The entire time, 20 to 30 seconds to sing happy birthday to yourself, not too fast, but nice and slow, sing happy birthday to yourself. That's the amount of time that we need to wash our hands with soap and water, okay? Make sure you wash their laundry. I said you could stay in your pajamas on the weekend. During the day, you need to get up and get dressed. The other people, if they're in their pajamas all day long, let's take those off, put on clean pajamas, and let's go wash those so we stay uh, relatively clean that way. And then um, as the care provider, make sure that you spend as little time in the room as possible. I know that you want to go over there and rub their head and rub their back and make them feel better and hand them another glass of water, that sort of stuff, but the shorter amount of time that you're in the bedroom with that person that's ill, the better. So the less time, the better. And again, no visitors. If somebody's sick in your house, no visitors. Limit the visitors completely to your household until that person is well. That's all that I have. Again, if you're ill, you need to stay home. Practice that social distancing, and we'll get through this. We're strong West Texas people, right? Thanks. Good evening. Thank you, Dr. Cook. Thanks for that update. Thank Catherine. We appreciate your update, too. I want to start with a, a bit of, of a, by the way, my temperature was 95.4 to this afternoon, in case you're wondering what I, they, they're shooting me. Um, some good news before I get to the, the business of the day. I, you probably are aware, but uh, 16 Lubbock ISD campuses uh, uh, provided curbside pickup of lunches today between 12 and 1.30. School, district, uh, school, school bus meal distribution also started with 20 buses delivering uh, meals for Lubbock ISD today. Last week, Meals on Wheels needed volunteers, and 125 people in our community volunteered. They, they, they feel like they're in a good spot right now. They promised to let us know if they need help. I've got a young man that I know who's furloughed here. He works in, in Switzerland. He's furloughed in Lubbock. And, he has really nothing to do, and he applied to, he's delivering for Meals on Wheels. I mean, he's one of those people that said, I need to find something to do, and I'm, I'm very thankful for that. The uh, Sun and Fun, the talking to YWCA Sun and Fun out on South, on 6200 block of Elgin. Today at lunch, they served free lunches, a grab and grow, beginning today, a grab and go lunch for anybody under the age of 18. And finally, our seniors, we talked a little bit about this last week, but in our at our adult activity centers, we're serving lunches to our seniors, and, and those, once again, are, are grab-and-go kind of lunches. And if you're not signed up for that, we can get you signed up for those. Those are grant-funded. There's a $3 suggested charge for that, but it's only suggested. We want to make sure that we get our people fed. All right? Okay, now, thank you for being here, and let's move to the, to the business of the day. Today, we're issuing an updated disaster declaration in response to questions that have arisen the last two days and to provide clarification. Our current declaration of disaster went into effect Friday, this past Friday, March the 20th at midnight. We cannot address every single clarification or every situation, but now after two days, we can make some clarifications. And we promised that we would look at this and do this, and we're doing so. By the way, these changes take effect tomorrow at 6 p.m. Let's start by talking about compliance. Overall, our compliance with the emergency order has been very good. Uh, our city manager, Mr. Atkinson, is going to talk later with some examples. Uh, but our loving businesses have been creative, uh, compliant, and still found a way to serve their customers. I, I got to share three examples. I, you know, I went to Caprock Cafe last night for curbside pickup. Fabulous. They got it figured out. They did a good job. Best Buy across the country, including in Lubbock, curbs, curbside pickup. They figured out a way to do that. Harbor Freight Tools, now I'm not, I didn't go there. People that know me well that know that 
I don't fix those kind of things. However, I've been told by two citizens that have gone there what a good job they've done with their social distancing and putting things on the floor so people, people know where to stand and very much taking serious the, the, the groups, the, your public groups are 10 or less. That's what we need. It comes down to this. We have decisions to make today and, we, and those decisions in changing our behaviors today will allow us to be back in business sooner. It's like this. If you don't have an essential reason for leaving your house, don't leave your house. We are flattening the curve locally. We're addressing our public health needs and we're adapting. However, we must stay the course. The sooner we do that, the sooner we're back to the Lubbock that we know and love. I want to speak a little bit on the items that came up last night regarding sheltering in place. You know that Dallas uh, issued that about the time we started our press conference last night. Waco uh, followed them this morning. Um, we expect that in a short amount of time, sheltering in place will become common in the largest Texas cities. I've talked to several of those mayors today. So here's my comment. I don't believe that sheltering in place is needed in Lubbock right now. And I think we can avoid doing it overall, but we need your help to do that. We need to make the decision individually to cha change our behavior. And we need to do it now. What we're seeing in larger cities, and I think a, a lot of the reasons they're taking these action is because of the load on their health care systems. We continue to be in conversations with Covenant and UMC. We've been in contact with both today. We were, uh, we were on a conference call with one of them this morning. We'll be, on, we'll be on the phone with both of them tomorrow morning. And I asked them this question about sheltering in place. I asked them if they were overloaded. They said no, not at this time. In fact, they said they were in good shape. They were planning and taking measures for the future and that the only thing they really need from us, well, really two things, is the PPE, this personal protection equipment that we've talked about, and then some, uh, swab, some swabs for testing that are, that are being done, both of which have been requested and we're doing all we can to prioritize getting those here. So let me summarize by saying, if we can follow the measures that have been put in place in Lubbock, I believe we can avoid the shelter in place. If the changes, uh, if that changes, I'll be the first one to, to talk to you about it. But right now, that's not the case. So I want to go over a few of the details of the changes we made to our uh, emergency declaration this afternoon. And I'm going to tell you that Lubbock can be different, that our West Texas pride, ingenuity, and initiative that are in our DNA, we need to turn that energy loose, dedicating ourselves to following this declaration of disaster. By doing so, we hope to avoid further actions. So let's talk about uh, what we've done. We're responding with clarification, as I mentioned earlier. Very briefly, we will talk about businesses that are absolutely essential and will stay open. I want you to know uh, information that we're using is coming from a, the, fed, the feds on this. It's coming from CISA, C-I-S-A, which is a part of Homeland Security. And I believe you've been provided with that information this evening. It'll be on our website in the morning. Here's what is staying open and is defined as essential. Grocery stores, access to medicine pet food, personal hygiene, vehicle fuel, supplies, supplies and maintenance, banks and financial institutions, professional services, health care providers, and daycare. When we walked out of here Friday, they, daycare were not on that essential list. They are now, and they are open, and we're thankful for that. In addition, those in, industries listed above and their supply chains. 
So the people that supply them are defined by CISA as open in Lubbock. Now here's what's closed. Non-essential personal services. Nail salons, hair salons, barber shops, tattoo and piercing shops, and the like. Also, retail establishments that don't sell food and medicine are defined as non-essential. Commercial entertainment venues, enclosed shopping malls, and group meeting spaces are all defined as non-essential. So why are these closed? There are valued community partners and our friends and our neighbors, but they're closed because we are attempting to limit face-to-face -face contact that is not essential. The sooner and the better we do this, the quicker we start getting better. We've received numerous phone calls about our building construction and home improvement retailers. Construction is defined as, as essential. Therefore, those establishments that provide their supply chain are essential. However, we're asking for them to help us out through this order. Those building supply and home improvement retailers will be limited to no more than 100 people or half of the posted occupancy levels, whichever is less. And that, those numbers, those max numbers include the employees. We're still requiring, further we're requiring, that they maintain good hygiene and social distancing in their stores to the complete extent that it is practical. We're going to keep those businesses open and maintain the essential services and, their, and therefore protect our people. Finally, as I said earlier, we cannot put something together that specifically identifies and calls out every type of industry. However, with each industry that is essential, we're also calling on our health department uh, so they can um, add some advice, some guidance around additional sanitation and cleaning. You heard, you heard Catherine mention some of that earlier. And advisories from that group are with coming. Gas stations are a good example where we routinely touch the, the pumps. Uh, for restaurants and grocery stores, you know, they're doing a nice job with their curbside pickup. They're taking all the precautions. The grocery stores are doing the same. We want that to become prevalent in our community. Before I ask Jared to comment briefly, please know that we'll be sending out a guidance document tomorrow based on this action. I hope it'll, it'll simplify things a bit, so please keep your eye open for that. We're going to take a few questions in, in a few minutes, but I want to remind everyone again that we're making good progress. We are seeing compliance, but we need to make good decisions. Let's change our behavior and get out of this sooner. I'm going to tell you a quick story before I turn it over to Mr. Atkinson. As I was coming down the escalator, my phone dinged, and I looked down at it, and a friend of mine, a young friend of mine, or relatively young, she's got a young family, she had sent me a video, and I thought, well, that's interesting. I'm going to watch it. And it was her husband and son and daughter and their dog on the couch. And it was just a, a video of encouragement for me, which was really cool. But they ended it with their youngest, their daughter, saying, thank you, Mr. Mayor, for keeping us safe. I think that's the message of the day. I think that's what this is about. That's what the city council and I are focused on, along with the leadership of the city of Lubbock. Thank you. Mr. Atkinson? Thank you, Mayor. So my assignment tonight, um, talk a little bit about enforcement. We've, asked, we've had questions asked about penalties and, and all of that, so I'm going to try to cover all of it. But to begin, it's just about compliance, okay? The, the number one thing is compliance. And the voluntary compliance of our people and of our establishments in Lubbock 
has been tremendous. We begin on March the 18th, literally and physically going out and doing checks. Of course, on March the 18th, the number was bigger. It was 200, it came down to 50, and it came down to 10. On March the 18th, for example, we did 56 physical checks of Lubbock establishments. We did numerous more by drive-bys. Sometimes it's not hard to tell that there's a large or not a large number of cars in the parking lot. On March the 18th, every one of those establishments was in compliance. We did it again on the 19th. We did it again on the 20th, etc. But on the 19th, as example, there were 50 physical checks. One of our people goes in, count noses if need be, did the drive-by checks as well. March the 19th, all establishments were in compliance. Did it again on the 20th. We did it on the 21st, so now we've changed. We're down to the 10 limit. We did 52 physical checks on the 21st. We did our drive-bys, and then we had a small group of targeted visits that we did. Those were based on some calls that we had. 50 of the 52 over the course of that day were in compliance when we got there. All 52 were in compliance by the time we left. They're working with us to correct it on site. So again, it's voluntary, it's working. Today, middle of the day, uh, phones are ringing, calls are coming in, hey, you, you need to go look at this, go look at that, and we did. So they're still working, so there'll be more tomorrow, but at the point I put the cutoff and got the information, we had done seven additional checks, the big numbers will come tonight, seven checks today, they were not all in compliance when we got there. They were all in compliance when we left. So as the mayor said, it's making decisions and it's changing behavior. And I'd suggest to you, it's happening. It's working well. But we continue to be asked, or these, these orders, which would be the governor's executive order, and the local declaration issued by the mayor and the Lubbock City Council, are they enforceable? And the answer to that is yes. They're absolutely enforceable. They do carry the potential for fine up to $1,000. They carry the potential for jail time up to 180 days. There's a process. The process we're using is both proactive and it's responsive. We know where to go look. We have pros out doing this and they continue to do it. We've had no shortage of phone calls. We continue to do that and to do that as well. And the way we do that, right now, each of these checks is being performed by a licensed peace officer. Our primary, our lead agency on that is the Lubbock Fire Marshal's Office. That is a relatively small group. They have taken this under their wing, made it their own, and they have been out working and working hard. They're backed up by the Lubbock Fire Department. I mean, I'm sorry, by the Lubbock Police Department. They work for the Lubbock Fire Department. They're backed up by the Lubbock Police Department also licensed peace officers, also with the authority to enforce. So when we say that, we say enforce, what does it mean? Number one, it's compliance. The vast, overwhelming majority of our establishments are in compliance when we get there. The very few that have not been have all voluntarily put themselves into compliance before our folks left. But if they don't, and I think this is a question I've had numerous times today. If they don't, what happens? Well, number one, I don't think it's going to get there. I really think that people will make good decisions. But if they do not, the establishment can be ticketed. The individuals inside the establishment can be ticketed. That's not limited to person number 11 and person number 12. Okay. If we can't gain voluntary compliance and a decision is made to issue citations, everybody there is going to get to share in the joy. All right? That can happen. If a citation is issued, that, of course, then will go through the court. That will be addressed later, which takes us to the second point. And the second point is very, very simple. That establishment can be closed right then right there. I'm no longer going to have a violation at that point. 
because nobody's in it and the door's not open. I've seen nothing, absolutely nothing, that tells me we're ever going to get to that point. I really appreciate what our people are doing, but I appreciate even more what the community and what our business establishments are doing. We've not gotten close to any of that, and I don't think we will. I don't think we will. So, anybody that does wish to report to us, I want you to call the non-emergency line at the Lubbock Police Department. That's 775-2865. Those calls will be logged, they'll be routed appropriately, and they'll be dispatched. We'll get there. We will continue doing our own proactive patrols, but we will absolutely be responsible. So kind of for my part to close, um, as the mayor said, th this is just about limiting to the extent we can face-to-face -face transactions. The more we do that, the faster we get back to normal, the faster everything is the way we all remember it to. Compliance has been voluntary, and I really think it's going to stay that way. And that's what we want. We're not after anything other than that. So Lubbock, you know, to our residents, to our businesses, our establishments, thanks. You're doing it, and we appreciate it. We're still going to be there looking, but I'm not expecting any problems. We can protect the public health. We can flatten the curve, and we will be back to business soon quicker we all make these decisions, the quicker we'll be there. So with that, I'm going to stop. Um, my final comment, as the mayor mentioned, there are two guidance documents that will end up posted tomorrow. You have one of them tonight, and that is that CISA document. Public Health will be posting an additional advisory similar to what Karen and Dr. Wells talked about today. So with that, thank you, and I'll hand it to Lacey, I believe. Take a question okay. or two. Okay, we're going to do one question at a time. If y'all come up to the mic, Karen. Mayor. Um. Before, Karen, before, you, before your question, just a, a, something for you guys I failed to mention. No press conference tomorrow night. We'll do press advisories as tests come in tomorrow. We expect that we would do a, test, a press conference sometime later in the week to update you on the overall status, but we think that the daily routine probably has run its course and we can communicate a a better way. We'll still communicate via social media and our website, but just prepare for that. Thank you. Mayor, you complimented Best Buy for going to curbside service, mm -hmm. pickup. Does that mean other buildings, facilities like, say, Dillard's or Home, uh, Bed Bath & Beyond? I've heard the Dillard's, for one, has had lots of online orders, as many as a holiday um, push for holiday online orders, and people are over there a lot. So will they stay open, any of establishments stay open, if they resort to curbside service? They can't stay open for retail. Um, in our, the, our, the way our ordinances or the way that the emergency order is written, um, if they want to do curbside, I don't, uh, that's something we could consider. I, I'm not sure if we've contemplated, we, we did contemplate that today. We're looking for creative ideas from retail. Um, I'll, I'll, let, I'll comment on that and let Mr. Atkinson maybe add to that. What, what, what are your thoughts about that? I just know they have a lot of business there right now. They said they had a lot of online deliveries that were going straight to Dillard's. And but they have a lot of people there that are not doing online, that are in the stores. True. And the, the, I mean, that, that's what we're trying to limit is the face-to-face. -face. And as, as long as it's just the online business, then I think our, our retailers, we certainly think they have the right to, and we encourage them to fulfill those orders. Mm -hmm. uh, if they want to do that via curbside, uh, then I think we're, we're open to th that idea. That curbside needs to be, you know, a, 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 a transaction that's not uh, that's that's guarded, like like we were talking about earlier. And can I ask a question, Dr. Cook? Sure. Dr. Cook, judging by what you've seen from this virus in other faraway places, and some of them have already peaked and are are not serious anymore, can you give us a timeline on how long you think this could last for Lubbock? Well, that depends on how fast it's spread, right? And so the whole purpose of flattening the curve is slowing it down. So, but how long a person, are you asking me how long a person is sick? No, how long do you think these restrictions will be in place based on the virus here? Right now it's very early. We'll just have to wait and see. We'll have to take it two weeks at a time. 
And right now this is for two weeks and so we'll just have to reevaluate then and see what our numbers are, see how our social distancing is affecting or flattening our curve. And so a lot of people are very concerned about people in the hospital. You know, earlier we heard that one person could go visit at the hospital, but they'd be screened as they went in. So now what happens? Now can, can one person still go visit a loved one in the hospital or in a I, nursing home? I think that, not the nursing home. I think that's the current standard for the hospitals. But the, the hospitals make those own rules, not us at this, at this point. And so I'd have to check with the hospitals and see what they're doing. So that's all in order to stop the spread. Okay. It's all... It, it's painful not to go see a loved one, but it, it is uncomfortable, I know that. But we've got to stop the spread. But you cannot go to a nursing home, you have to call instead. Right now, that's right. Good evening, everybody. Um, Christy Martinez Garcia, Latino Olympic Magazine. And I guess what I want to know a little bit more, I mean, your city staff has really been working and we appreciate it, I, it really reflects and how things have been handled, so thank you for that. But today, Plainview announced that it's gonna be holding city council meetings remotely. Is this something that the city of Lubbock might consider? Yes. And? Not tomorrow. <laughs> Not tomorrow. Not tomorrow. We're business as usual tomorrow. You've seen we've taken the seats out of here. We, we, we know of another city that's doing theirs remotely tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Our interpretation of the openness of those meetings is pretty significant. We want to make sure that if we're going to do them um, virtually, that there's plenty of bandwidth for citizen call, uh, mm -hmm. uh, phone calls to listen to the meeting and to comment. So I would imagine that by our April 14th meeting, meeting we'll have that in place. That's three weeks after tomorrow. But, but you'll to be in a new building by then? Yeah, that's the idea, yes. And we also have canceled most of, um, as we did last week, I think you're aware, but most, all of our boards and commissions have been canceled except those that have um, um, the uh, governmental authority. So I think zoning, uh, planning and zoning, mm -hmm. ZBA and the city council are the only ones that will still meet. You know, Mayor, this is kind of an important question because we are approaching the census. Yes. And we know that something like this has affected the momentum of the census, this and other things. Talk a little bit about that and why, maybe while people are at home, why this could be an opportunity. So the census is very important. You can go online right now and fill out your census form. The census day is, uh, is April 1st. I got guidance just this afternoon from the feds around the census. I have not even had a time to read it yet. Um, I would imagine there'll be some some changes to the way we go about that as a country. But I think the message to our people is, please go ahead and fill out your census forms. You should have seen a couple pieces of mail at your home by now. It's very important for all the reasons we've discussed previously. And for the city services that are provided. Thank you. Hi, just have a quick question for your, uh, Mr. Atkinson. Um, so this is in regards to uh, businesses that might not be in compliance with the disaster declaration. Um, so you mentioned the non-emergency line that you recommend people call. Um, we've had a few employees that have uh, messaged us, you know, let us know that they, maybe their employers aren't following protocol. So is there something that's going to protect the employee's identity? Is it an anonymous call that they can be made to that non-emergency line? Absolutely. We want people to contact us. We don't go knock on the door and say, Jarrett told me that this is going on. We would like people to leave us their name and number, just if we have a question. Same, same thing we would do with a, a standard police report. But no, please encourage all of them to contact us. We're not going to go in and put that information out. We just want compliance. That's all it's about. So we've had a few of those that we have investigated, uh, and we found that there wasn't an issue, or there was just maybe a misunderstanding of what the rule was at the moment. So we're there to help in all those cases. Let me, let me add on to that. We had a number of calls today with people concerned about the school district's decision to have employees come back to work. We fully support that decision. That's not our decision. It does no good to call the city about that. They're fully in compliance. Second, we've had one individual call four times anonymously and send one email concerned about a auto shop, auto, uh, uh, you know, an auto shop. An auto shop is, is essential. It supply, it, 
provides for logistics. It provides to keep things moving in our community. So let's, let's be serious about this. Let's not uh, take the time of people who are trying to serve the citizens by hear, hearing people that don't like a decision that was made. Thanks. That's all I have. Thank you. One more question. This is either for Mayor Pope or Mr. Atkinson. I've read this about three or four times in the new declaration. Um, laundromats, washeterias, are those considered essential? It's not in our guidance to whether or not they're essential or not. Um, certainly the 10 person, um, I would I'd imagine to some of our families they are essential. Um, we need to make sure that 